Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Todd Wagner, and I'm with the Council on Undergraduate Research. And this Kerr conversation is being recorded, and uh, all of you and all the registrants will be emailed a link to the video. Uh, it will also get posted to Kerr's YouTube page. Because it is being recorded, we ask that unless you are uh, speaking or asking a question, that you remain muted so that we can capture the best sound quality possible. And if at any time during this um, Kerr conversation you need any technical assistance, uh, you will see someone down there by Kerr Luke Z. So Luke Z is here with any technical assistance you may need. You can uh, reach out to him in a private chat. So back in August of this year, Kerr uh, very proudly released Confronting Failure, Approaches to Building Confidence and Resilience in Undergraduate Researchers. And this ebook is open access, which means anyone can get a copy of it for free by simply going to kerr.org slash bookstore. And in conjunction with the release of the book, we've been putting a, together a series of Kerr conversations, these informal conversations. The first one's with the editors, Lisa Corwin, Lou Charcutian, and Jennifer Hemstra. And they spoke very broadly on the theme of failure and what that looks like across uh, disciplines. And then the following Kerr conversations have featured various chapter contributors. One was kind of centered on the theme of preparing for failure, another one on responding to failure, and then finally this one, mentoring through failure. All those earlier conversations, of course, can be found on the Kerr's YouTube page as well, if you're interested in those. What we'll do is we'll take a minute here to introduce our panelists. Then uh, we'll give them an opportunity to give a brief recap of their chapters. And then finally, we will engage with your thoughts and questions, both from uh, their chapters specifically, but also if you just have any questions or thoughts on the general theme of the book, of failure, of uh, undergraduate researchers, of building confidence and resilience. And then uh, perhaps you may also have some situations in which you would love the panel to speak into. We welcome all of that. I will be monitoring the chat, uh, so you can also place your question in there. But um, when your time comes, you can simply unmute yourself, ask your question that way. All right, let's do introductions. And we will begin with Amanda. Is that me? Do I introduce myself? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Greenwell. I'm an assistant professor of English at Central Connecticut State University, um, and I focus on literary studies, and I also do teacher preparation for secondary English. It's nice to be here with you all. Awesome. And then Lisa. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Jasinski, and I currently work as the Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And the project I'm going to talk about today uh, is one that I did at my previous institution, Trinity University in San Antonio. Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Dunbar-Wallace. I'm a researcher at University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, I am new or newer to um, discipline, disciplinary based education research, and I'm very interested in course based undergraduate research experiences and what those outcomes are like for instructors adopting those new new ways of teaching. And then Meredith. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Henry. Um, I'm a lecturer at Georgia State University in psychology. At the time uh, Amy and I wrote this chapter, I was a postdoc in science education research uh, for Emory University. Um, and uh, again, I just want to say sorry if I have connection issues. I am doing this car for my car. Um, I just got done teaching a class across campus from my office. So. Uh, thanks for your patience if that happens. And finally, we have Andrea with us. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Sell. I'm an Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and Research at Cal Lutheran University, which is a regional college in um, California, just, just north of LA. We're Hispanic serving, and we have about 2,000 undergraduate students, um, a large summer research program, and we also do research during the year. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, we have four chapters represented here today. So chapter six uh, was written by Amanda. 
confronting failure by facilitating transfer, mentoring undergraduate research in literary studies with an understanding by design framework. So unpack that for us a little bit. What happened in this chapter? Chapter six. Sure, thanks, Todd. So um, first of all, I was excited to be included in this chapter because um, English is not always represented in conversations about undergraduate research. Um, and when it is, it's often represented through the disciplines of like writing center studies or composition studies, which tend to have one of those more kind of even like social sciences components to them um, in their research methods. And so I was when I saw this call, I was thinking about well, we do a lot of this mentoring in English. Like, how do we do it? What does it look like? How have I been doing it? Um, and so one of the things that's interesting about mentoring undergraduate research in English is that like research in most disciplines, it can be really messy, but it's got its own kind of brand of messiness. And I often see sort of our roles as, um, as professors and instructors is helping students just navigate the mess, right? Like we're not there to take the mess away. Um, we're there to help them understand that the mess is actually the fun part or the important part. And we have to make some choices as we navigate through that. And so that means that failure is part of that, right? There's dead ends. There's you know things you follow that you think are gonna pan out and they don't. Um, you have to regroup and, you know, we don't, we don't really always have like a failed experiment, so to speak, that sort of shows us that we have to sort of have this it, instinct to, to say like, mm, this isn't working, right? This isn't going in the right direction. And so what my chapter does is it discusses, you know, how we can use um, a framework called Understanding by Design, which is a, an educational framework that was um, uh, put forth by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe. And, and it's about how do we get students not just to sort of do the things, right, that we want them to do in class, but to, to really understand them deeply, right, and have this, this conceptual understanding. And that means that we sort of have to start with that huge picture, right, which in terms of literary research for me is the mess, it's the twists and turns, it's the how we navigate things, it's the I don't even know how I'm necessarily going to use a source sometimes until I'm halfway through my project and then I figure out how it fits right but there was something that told me it was important so I hung on to it. Um, and so I, I discuss in the chapter how I design my class with these kind of you know major like enduring understandings, which is a phrase from from understanding by design that that drive everything that I do um, and they're big right so there are three one is that strong literary studies researchers conceive original scholarly arguments about primary texts and respond to ongoing critical conversations in the field of scholarship. The second is strong literary studies researchers employ sources in various and nuanced ways. And that's a big one I, ha not, I have to crack with my students pretty often. And those two understandings are very, um, you know, tied to like actual things that researchers do. Um, they're, they're almost a little bit more concrete even in their abstraction. But the third one, and the one that's probably going to matter most to our discussion today, is that strong literary studies researchers employ a recursive, iterative process for idea conception and research practices, and that that's a process that requires discipline-savvy metacognition in order to navigate successfully. So, you know, I see a lot of the mentorship that I do with my students landing in that that one, right? Like, how do we, yes, we're going to do these things, but why are we doing them? How do we develop the instincts to do them with more efficiency or more insight or just excitement, I suppose, about the fact that some things don't always work out? Um, and so throughout my, my piece, I discuss how, what do I do in my class that kind of helps those three things come to fruition for my students? And in particular, not just how do I set them up to do it, but how do I respond when they try it, right? Whether that means a failure or a success to get them to that, that metacognitive moment. And as with probably a lot of my fellow speakers today, emotions are part of that, right? Like helping students navigate what it means to fail in a way that's actually a fail forward um, to recognize that, well, the work you did doesn't mean it doesn't matter anymore. It actually got you to a place where now you're ready to do the work that will end up, you know, in your, your final product. So I'm excited to talk about that um, with all the folks today. Awesome. And then we have uh, Lisa here with us from chapter 11, which was called Picture This, Normalizing Struggle failure and doubt among summer undergraduate researchers in the arts and the humanities. Tell us more about that. Sure. Um, thank you, Todd. Uh, thank you to everyone. 
So in 2019, um, I had a, worked with a small research team and our project included following 20 undergraduate research students um, at Trinity, which is a small private liberal arts college. And all of these students were doing projects and disciplines like history, religion, literature, theater. And they were working in um, a 10 week full-time undergraduate research program. So it's, we kind of know this most often from the sciences, but it's a growing practice in, in other fields. And I wanna say that there's many ways in which doing undergraduate research in the humanities is a lot like doing research in STEM fields, some of the ideas transfer. But one really important structural difference is that oftentimes humanists work alone so it's not uncommon for an individual scholar or mentor to be working with an individual student. And I think that that just slightly changes the dynamics a little bit um, and sort of leads to this project. So what my team and I did is um, we didn't set out to study failure. We wanted to really map the undergraduate research experience from a student's perspective. And invariably ideas of failure, struggle, doubt, became part of it. So we um, met with this cohort of 20 students throughout the summer. Um, I'm a social scientist, so we gave them lots of surveys. And uh, we met, uh, I think, four times over the course of the summer for focus group conversations. And in addition to being a data collection method, these focus groups became really kind of vital places for sense making, for community building, for some griping, um, but also some resource sharing. So um, just as a kind of a broad category, uh, I'll just say in my remarks now, and then I'm happy to answer questions. But I think that um, I tried to write the chapter to do two big things. And to one, was to actually just bring forward some ideas about what failure meant to the students we met with. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, some things we learned from the content. And then we also wrote the chapter, um, I'm the author on it, but I, I had some great silent partners in the background um, to be a practical guide. So if you like this idea and you wanna use this with your students, whether they are working during the semester, no matter what discipline they're working at, I think that there's just some practical transferable ideas we could take forward. But just for the first one, I thought that I would maybe share three big takeaways, at least how, how our students thought about um, failure and doubt. The first is that students had often internalized what I would say were unrealistically high expectations. So students came into these projects thinking that um, their mentor expected them to, um, you know, that they would follow in the shoes of their mentor, that they would go to graduate school and, and earn a doctorate and become a professor, that by the end of the summer, they would be doing publishable quality research. And then students, because they had this kind of unrealistic bar, often felt like they weren't living up to um, what were kind of unarticulated and unrealistic expectations. So the first is that students expect too much of themselves. The second, and um, there's a lot of ideas from Carol Dweck's work around fixed and growth mindset that come out all the time in undergraduate research. You won't be surprised that our students had it too. Many students were sort of quick to draw to the, to the conclusion that a failure, a setback, a struggle, was a reflection of them kind of not being enough as opposed to being a novice that's on a trajectory. So I think the more that we can do as mentors to remind them that this is a bigger process is, is very helpful. And then um, I would say that the, the kind of deepest concerns and kind of highest anxiety points we saw is that um, students really, when they think about failure, they measured it in terms of productivity and output. And um, in some ways, if their mentors hadn't necessarily given them frameworks or way of thinking about this, that um, students would often, again, sort of jump to their own conclusions. And if they felt like they hadn't maybe written enough pages or they hadn't worked enough hours, 
those were things that sort of came up a lot in our focus groups. One thing I didn't talk a lot about in the chapter, but I will mention that our students saw a real spike in anxiety about the halfway point of the summer, right? They're saying it's almost over and any good research project, usually the halfway point is really like you're just getting started, but they felt like they should be done. So there's just a little bit of calibration. So under this kind of second big heading of some practical tips that you might be able to take with you into your own work, um, Amanda, I really love your um, phrasing that um, as mentors, we help students navigate the mess. And I think what um, one big takeaway um, from our chapter is that um, some of that mess is around the actual work and skill of doing research. How do you access a database? What's an abstract and how do you write it? There's skills like that. But frankly, the bigger takeaway is that there's a lot of other mess involved in undergraduate research. And um, working to kind of overcome anxiety around things like research productivity and output is something I know that I struggle with as a non-novice researcher. Um, hitting a dead end in the research process, working through ambiguity. And one that came up a lot um, in our project was actually around work-life balance. So how much should you work? And then how do you learn to kind of close the computer and go on with your life? And I think as mentors, making space to talk to our students about that is something we can, it's just as important as say, learning to write an abstract. Um, the other thing I would say, just again, just under these practical tips, is that I am really persuaded around the idea of networked mentoring, right? We can't get everything we need from one person. And so I would say that if you're working with undergraduate students, um, keep in mind what, what you can do and what you can tell them, and then also recognize and make space for other people. So I, um, students really love being able to talk to me as a neutral researcher. I wasn't involved in the administration of the program. Um, I had a student working with me on this project. So I, I was a mentor, but I wasn't their mentor. So if they had to navigate just some awkward interpersonal dynamics or frustration or confusion, I was a safe space for them to vent. Um, or even talk about things like doubts about graduate school that they could come to me and it was a lot safer than uh, maybe going to their mentor they didn't want to disappoint. Um, the last thing um, that I would say is um, we used a really great technique in this project and I'm happy to say more about it called photo voice. And it was a way that we actually got students to open up and tell stories that was a little bit more creative than just asking them a, a question. We asked them, to prepare photographs about what doing research looks like and feels like. And um, I just wanna make just a, a general plug for sometimes being indirect in your questioning. And um, I'm happy to say a little bit more about that, but it can be really intimidating um, for a student to come to a professor and if they don't know how to ask the question. So I think in some ways, um, some of the bigger takeaways are just different ways of getting at questions, learning to kind of read between the lines, and also um, helping students just normalize and talk about what is it going well. So I, I'm happy to answer questions later that are specific about arts and humanities, but I see this work as largely transferable. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from other folks. Great. Uh, chapter 14, we have both Amy and Meredith with us. It was entitled, how Mentors Help Us Learn to Fail, Reflections from the Academic Family Tree. Hi, so Meredith and I uh, started this off um, as a reflective activity, thinking about what were those mentoring practices that worked really well for us to, to help us find success in research and academia. Um, and so we spent some time doing that, and then we, we coded our own reflections, and that helped us to really think about what we would like to ask these mentors who were so helpful to us in the past. Um, and that was actually, it was a really lovely experience getting to um, 
talk back with with folks who I found so inspirational and wonderful. Um, the three uh, the three researchers who we were able to interview um, have produced lots of successful folks who've gone on to be uh, physicians, researchers, PhDs, um, lots of, of different areas. Um, one of the, the big takeaways for me was that one, one particular researcher who I worked with um, had a very large undergraduate research lab and it was predominantly English as a second language students and predominantly first generation in the US students. And so they, they had a lot of hidden curriculum to overcome, to find success. And a lot of these students, um, everything was very competitive for them. Uh, because they had to overcome so much to begin with just to get into college in the first place. But then almost all of them to a person were pre-med and preparing for those, those entrance exams um, while being ESL and like, like very newly ESL, like maybe had only been speaking English for two or three years. So they're, they're reading these heavy, dense scientific texts and scientific articles um, as like, Know, third year of knowing English, that's pretty amazing to me. So there was a lot of things that they they had to overcome. And so the, the big takeaways from, from our paper or our chapter was we wanted to leave with, with three hypotheses and recommendations. And the first hypothesis is that mentoring really should address all facets of scientific and professional endeavors for students. Um, there's a lot that we intuit um, as researchers that we we just know because we know, but there's a lot of brand new folks coming in, don't know what we know. You know, it's all behind that hidden curriculum. So it's it's really worth taking the time and having that patience to get to know those student researchers about where they are and what they do know, what their experiences are. What are the biases that the students are coming in with? Like what, what is their image of a scientist and what scientists do or um, humanities researchers? So, you know, what, what are those things that they understand about that that may or may not match up to what is really going on? Um, so that will really help us to address the, the hidden curriculum and to peel back some of those layers on how we can be most useful to them. And that doesn't necessarily have to be only in the outside of class time research space. We can provide these mentoring practices within the classroom as well. Uh, our second hypothesis is that sharing failure experiences and vulnerabilities will create a space for students to share their own vulnerabilities and fears, as well as opening lines of communication because we all make mistakes, we all have stumbling blocks and we all face failure from time to time. And so it's really important for these new young students to see this as well. Um, it's important for students to be exposed to people at, at various points on their trajectory of their career um, so that they can, they can calibrate a bit, but they can also see what's possible. A third hypothesis that we have is when unexpected results or failures occur, occur Focusing on the process of doing the science and the curiosities and questions that the process elicits and the opportunities for learning rather than just the results can reframe the failure as a positive experience, right? So that goes back to the iteration. I love the word iteration, right? Because everything that we do in research is about iterating. Um, we don't always get the full picture in one shot. We have to constantly go back and refocus and relearn. And by showing students that 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 is where the meat of research is, uh, is really important. Um, you know, one of the folks that I interviewed had said that they, they considered failure being when a student just fully walks away, when they are just done. That's, that's the failure in their eyes as a mentor. Um, they want these students to feel like there's so many options and they don't have to fit what that mentor's mold is, that these students are free to shape their own future and that we are here as mentors to be support systems and to help them to get where they want to be. Uh, Meredith, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, just a couple things. Um, I mean, Amy, you summarized it fairly well. Um, just uh, to flush out a couple of the points you made, I think with our, our three recommendations, there are three hypotheses. The one that to me was really important or sort of not necessarily newer, but one that I personally want to sort of focus in on because um, was not necessarily um, something I was already kind of working on with the first one about making sure to emphasize um, all the aspects 
So one of the anecdotes that an instructor that Amy interviewed that really stuck out to me was they were telling the story of a student getting ready to go to a med school interview. And to sort of help them out, they did like a mock interview because they were going to have to, they hadn't really traveled before. So they're going to have to travel. They were going to have to go fly, uh, take a secondary transport to go to the hotel, get the way to the interview, and then do the interview. So they just had them run through all of that. And it was really helpful for the student, but the mentor thought it would be helpful for them to practice, like, the academic side of the interview. And the student found it really helpful because they got to practice all the logistical aspects because they hadn't had all of these experiences of getting to travel, getting to figure out how do you catch your Uber or your cab, how do you check into your hotel. Um, and so by getting to practice those, they didn't have to waste the cognitive resources the day of. And so they were able to stay more focused and be more confident in their interview. So sort of being able to consider those sorts of things um, as a mentor um, or even just include those opportunities, even if they don't necessarily occur to you uh, first off, um, is, you know, it's amazing how powerful that can be. And I think we just sort of uh, saw that emphasized in a lot of the anecdotes. Um, and then, yeah, just that last point about um, emphasizing the process. You know, um, we have so many great quotes. If you haven't had a chance to read them yet, I highly recommend it. Um, there's one super great quote about um, just trying to tell students, you know, students tend to think if results don't turn out the way you expect them to, that they failed. Like I have students sometimes when I'm talking to them about research methods in my psychology classes, sometimes I ask them what makes a good research project and more of them than I would ever want say significant results, right? Or results that confirm your hypothesis. And it's like, no. Um, but so there's a great quote there um, where they're talking about, you know, did you do the research? You know, did you get to the end and did something happen? Like, congratulations, you did it. That was research. And then they talked about now you get the fun of figuring out what it means. And just that spirit of that I thought was so great. And if we could find a way. And then just the last thing I'll say is this exercise that Amy and I did where we sat for a second and we thought about um, these mentors. And that started really in thinking about the taking a second to think about those times that you don't tend to like to think about, right? The times when you kind of screwed up and things went wrong. Um, and how people around you reacted, uh, for good or for ill. We were both very lucky in that we had some really great responses and great mentors. Um, but so reflecting on that first and then taking this vocabulary um, from the Ebbe et al. and the Fund et al. papers that we cite in our chapter, because really all that we did sort of in this chapter um, is we acknowledge that there's this wonderful growing body of research talking about how important it is for students to have this mindset where they see failure as a growth opportunity instead of um, something negative. And then there's also a body of research that has identified different mentoring practices that can be really helpful. And so trying to get the two to meet and to see which of these mentoring practices go with this sense of it's okay. It's okay if you stumble. It's okay if you're challenged or if you fail. So just um, taking, you know, that half an hour, an hour to like think back on some of your own personal experiences and then go and match it up with like some of the scholarly work of the words, I found very helpful and sort of to get a more objective sense of what has helped me. Um, what do I maybe want to do? And because then from there, you can go about making use of all this really great literature um, that has been done on mentoring to help you um, maybe develop those skills once you know what they are. Um, yeah, that's all I would add. Perfect. And then um, chapter 15, uh, we have uh, three authors, well, one of them with us today, but it was entitled Coping with the Researcher's School of Hard Knocks, How Undergraduate Research Students and Their Mentors Respond to Failure and Rejection. All right, thank you. Um, so in our chapter, my co-authors and I describe a survey that we sent to all students who had registered for research credits in the last month, uh, nine months at our university 
and all faculty who had taught a section of that research. And we asked them about coping strategies. So what do they use? And then what do they find effective? We had strategies pulled from various articles. Um, so they weren't strategies that we came up with. They were already in the literature. And for each strategy, we asked them, how, how much do you use this strategy? And then right below it, how effective do you think it is? And we left it really open in terms of um, failure or uh, rejection. So um, in terms of how often do you use this for failure slash rejection? We gave a couple examples, but we also noted, you know, you're all at different stages. So whatever that means to you, use that when you're um, taking the survey. And so for the faculty, we asked, how, how much do you use this with your students? Like how much do you teach it? And how effective do you find it for your students, right? So not in terms of how much they use it for their own research, but how much do they use it in their mentoring? Um, so we had um, quite a lot of data and I had a, a student working with me as well. And I think we had um, we had the quantitative portion. We also had the open-ended questions. And one of the things we decided we we're like, okay, the open-ended ones is too much. We're not doing, we're not gonna code these responses. Um, so kind of setting a boundary for her that so she didn't have to <laughs> analyze all of this data. But um, so just gonna focus on the, the quantitative here. But the big takeaways were that students and faculty report using and finding effective um, all of the things that we, we think of should be effective from the literature. So celebrating success, behavior change, reflection, rationalizing, that kind of thing. So they tend to use what we know is effective from the literature. Um, however, we did find some differences across groups and that students report using social withdrawal and denial much more than faculty would want them to. Um, and they also report lower use of celebrating success. So while that one was high, it was a little bit lower relative to the other ones, which was uh, I, I feel is a little problematic for them. Um, we also find that they report using some negative strategies like avoidance, denial, comparison, social withdrawal. Um, but at the same time, they're rating these strategies as low in effectiveness. So they understand that they're low in effectiveness, but they still report using them, um, which I found interesting. And I was also like, yay, good job being honest on my survey. <laughs> um, they're not just rating everything as high. They're actually seeing some differences there. Um, on the flip side, we report uh, they report higher ratings of effectiveness for celebrating success, emotion regulation, work-life balance but reporting lower use of those. So again, they know what's effective, they know what's probably not as effective, but they're having trouble actually doing it in real life. Um, so I think the big takeaway for us is that as faculty mentors, encouragement or just telling students what works is probably not enough because they, they know what works in their heart. They know what's healthy, what's a healthy way of coping with rejection. Um, they just need help putting it into practice. And I think that's what we can do as mentors and of leaders of undergraduate research um, offices and programs is really helping them with that. Um, so some concrete things to take back to your institutions, um, the social withdrawal piece and the isolation. And this one connects up to the other item, which is social support network. So these go hand in hand, right? So we see increased use of um, social support network, decreased use of social isolation, right? Um, so this one actually, uh, Lisa, I think you had mentioned they struggle with isolation as well, right? And so one of the things that we can do is just make sure that they have a way to connect with other researchers. So if they're um, working in a, a lab or research group or maybe just one-on-one -on -one with a faculty like in humanities, getting events together. So once a week have an event where everybody doing research on campus comes together for a lunch or networking or something, right? So making it so that they have those connections, um, making sure that they have a place to work on their research where other researchers are working. So just like co-working, even if they're not in the same lab, they can co-work together and get that camaraderie. Um, lunches, coffees go a, a long way. Um, so anything to help them create those connections. Um, I think sometimes as mentors, we think they need to make their own friends and like there's nothing we can do about it, right? Where like, that's on them. I, I'm i just the mentor. You guys have to make your own friends. So, like, I'm not going to be social coordinator here. But that really is like 
a role that we can do, right? We're in perfect positions to do that for them, whether it's um, funding lunches or events, right? Or, or networking with other faculty around campus and being like, hey, I only have one student researcher this summer. You only have one student research uh, this summer. Let's get them together. Let's all go out to lunch together, even if it's a cross discipline, right? So I think we're in a good position to actually help them with that. Um, one more and then I'll I'll stop talking. Um, another thing we can do is to normalize that failure. And this was part of our rationalizing item. Um, and I think a couple other people mentioned this too. So that underscores their ideas. But understanding that failure is part of that research um, process is really important. And I've seen a number of cool ideas out there like uh, rejection CV. Um, so having a CD CV of all the times that we ourselves got rejected that we can share with them be like, look, Rejection is something that I've experienced too. Um, the rejection party idea, I don't know where I saw that. I think it was on Facebook or Twitter, but I love it. I'm going to do it this year. We're going to have a party where everybody brings their rejections. Um, it's going to be a rejection party. We're going to make it really fun. Um, so things like that, where we can normalize it and make it um, not such a scary thing, make it like, this is what we all go through and it's okay. Um, do you know those things where they read out those bad um those bad evals or something on Twitter or TikTok. So I think we're going to do that at our rejection party where we're going to read the bad reviews. <laughs> um, and so everyone's going to stand up and read like some terrible uh, review or two line that they got or something. And, and I'm hoping to get, um, oh, you saw it on there. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to get some faculty involved so that the faculty are the ones putting themselves on the spot rather than the students, because I think the faculty will have a, a really fun time with that too. Um, so anyway, those are some things we can do and some takeaways from our survey, and I'm looking forward to discussing this further with you guys. Brilliant. So the rest of our time, I see people making comments um, in the chat already. But um, you can feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand using the reaction button, and I'll track that. Or you can put your questions directly into the chat, and I'll ask them on your behalf. I will point out um, there is a chapter called Welcome to the Rejection Party that lists several, um, several suggestions like that. That was a, a wonderful chapter. So by all means, download the book, um, read all of it, even if it at first doesn't appear to apply to your discipline. The amount of overlap that was there across disciplines, across uh, um, institution types, across fields, uh, yeah, cures and REUs and summer stuff, like all that, it was really quite amazing. So if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself or a thought or a scenario you would like the panel to weigh in on, all is accepted. Andrea, are you raising your hand? Because I you am. Are. I have a question. Go for it. Um, yeah. So, in our survey, we had work life balance as one of the items. And I think a few of the other panelists mentioned this one. Um, I actually did not have any good recommendations for this, but I noticed there was that difference. The faculty, it was in the faculty, so I didn't I didn't really hone in on it because it wasn't a student difference, but faculty know work-life balance is effective, but they don't use it as much. Um, and so I'm just wondering if this is something we struggle with as faculty, how are how can we mentor our students in it, right? Like this is one of our our big weaknesses as um, as professors and, and administrators. So any recommendations for how to mentor students in work life balance when when we probably don't do so good at it ourselves? Well, I don't I don't think I have the answer, Andrea, but um, I, I will say that I think actually just saying that out loud is a huge part of it. So um, I, I think it's it's a psychologist, one of the psychologists in the call will have to help me. It's Bowen, right, who talks about under functioning and over functioning as kind of pattern stress responses. So mm -hmm. over functioner and I identify as an over functioner. I know when I get stressed out, it means that I, I tend to like do more of my fair share, right? I overthink things. I put in more hours versus somebody who's an under functioner kind of shuts down and uh, maybe just like is almost paralyzed. Like they can't, they can't work. But I think one of the things we would often talk about with students in the focus group was 
Like, what does your schedule look like? And I think for a lot of students, they find themselves in this place that's half working, half playing, and it's neither productive work, nor is it really restorative rest. So it's um, half watching something on Netflix you've seen before while you have a Word document open that you're not really writing. And I felt like that was the work-life balance question was so big, but that was a really small behavior we could say is like, well, actually, why don't we talk about some strategies where you could do some concentrated work, either finish a task or work for an assigned amount of time, then close the computer, go take a walk, do something social. And maybe because the idea of work-life balance feels kind of overwhelming, being able to kind of chip away of like, what does work look like and what does rest look like felt like at least that was something we could get our hands around rather than the huge question of work-life balance. Um, But I would also say, because I worked with people in the summer, it was always really kind of awkward and dicey when a professor says, I'm gonna be away on vacation for the next two weeks. And for the students, it's like prime research time, but It was also important to say like, I'm not gonna be checking my email that much or we're gonna have a set time and place where we talk. Like, I don't want you sending me email at midnight. So I think maybe just kind of articulating some boundaries, but but I also just think, you know, letting students see the fact that this is something people struggle with as adults is, is maybe a step in the right direction. I'll just jump in in terms of thinking about like the student population you're working with as well. I work um, primarily with students who who some of them are working full time, some of them have you know almost the equivalent of full time job if you put together their part time stuff. A lot of them think of um, the time they can carve out to do their academic work as life and then the stuff they do for a wage as work. And so I think like for different people, there's different connotations for even those terms and what they mean. So my students are often looking for like intellectual breathing room that their their other duties sort of don't give to them. So sometimes it's not even like the academic work that is the stressor. It's it's the I have to do this in order to live right type of work that that is impinging on other things. So I think the ways that we mentor students through this stuff are going to be really specific to to these different situations that they're experiencing. I don't I necessarily have any answers either other than like those sensitivities I think are something we have to take into account. I will say um, Eric and Caroline who are authors of chapter 16, a community of scholars approach. Um, I, I thought their work on the power of co-mentoring um, both to bring a sense of balance to their own lives, but also as a modeling um, for their own students on how to do it as teams, even when it's an individual assignment was, um, there's probably some nuggets in that chapter as well, worth digging into. That's chapter 16. Say, I also really like Lisa's um, network of mentors. Mm. I think that's really important and powerful in in STEM. especially newer students really get caught up in the lore of working late at night in the lab. And, but it's, it's almost like a, um, I don't know, a badge of honor to say that you stayed up late working. And a lot of folks are pushing back on that, which is really great. It helps us all have more work-life balance. And the, the more, the more mentors you have in your network who are, who are modeling that behavior, the, the better the work situation will be for everybody. Mm-hmm. So I have another another question or point, um, and this one is for uh, uh, Lisa. So um, the the idea that we as mentors um, might be the source of failure for our students, um, basically this idea that they feel they're letting us down, um, was huge to me. And it, I think it was it was a really good reminder for me to to talk with my students and say, Hey, what do you think my expectations of you are? right? Because I don't know if we're on the same page about that. I I really don't expect a lot from them, right? The research poster at our regional conference is is our our learning outcome. And I wonder, 
if they're expecting or if they're thinking I'm expecting a ton from them, right? And and I don't even know this. And I think that this is a really good reminder for us to check in and, and see what what is it that they think? Um, and are they, do they think they're letting me down when they're really not, right? Um, so I just wanted to point that out. I thought that was a great reminder. And if you have any extra thoughts on that. Well, I, I'm so glad you asked. And honestly, so sometimes when we would sit in these focus groups, you know, the great thing about running a focus group is that all you really ask, all you really say is like, say more or give me an example. And I could not believe how many students had these um, completely unrealistic expectations. So one student saying, you know, I'm just letting my mentor down. You know, I really wanted to read 20 scholarly articles yesterday. And I thought it was like, why do you, why do you think that's the expectation? But, um, you know, the good news is, is I think when we bring students into undergraduate research, we like to talk to them about all the doors it could open. But I think sometimes we say, for example, perhaps including one of these next five things. And um, Amanda, I'm really sensitive to your point about how much population matters. My students tend to be extremely high achieving kind of overachievers. So they, they automatically think like, I'm gonna do everything. And, um, and then if they started to waver and they thought, maybe I don't wanna go to graduate school, maybe, maybe academia, what I thought I was gonna do, maybe this isn't what I wanna do now. They're almost afraid to bring it up to the mentor. And, and, and I knew all of my you know, faculty mentors and I said, I don't think they would feel that way. I think they want you to figure out if this is for you not necessarily to copy, but um, I think kind of just getting students to articulate that and also recognizing that they might not be perfectly honest with you when they, because they don't want to, they don't want to say the wrong thing or, or aim too low. But um, I'm just glad that you ask, because if you don't know what your students think, they're probably harboring an idea that's too complicated and unrealistic. And actually, I think that's an interesting question to throw back to Meredith and Amy. Um, as you think about your own self as mentees, how did you go into research expectations, right? You went in, I'm guessing like you were ready to hit it out of the park, right? You were going to be the one who published something first author in a peer reviewed journal and re rewrote the field. But um, I, don't, I don't know if that rings true to you at all. Like when you start a new project, your expectations and uh, hopes and dreams are sky high. And the idea that if any little, there's any little kink in the armor, it feels like it's really uh, deflating. All my metaphors today, all my, all my metaphors. Well, so for in STEM, it's very rare for undergraduates to be first authors on a publication, um, just first and foremost. So that was when I was an undergraduate, that was never even a thought in my head. Uh, but, and a lot of the things that we work on are very large scale, um, highly collaborative projects. And so the big fear was always, if I mess this up, I am letting all these people down across all these institutions and there'll be additive effects. So um, one of the labs I worked in did a huge Mendelian quantitative genetic study where we grew and processed thousands and thousands and thousands of plants. If we killed a flat of plants, that's a huge chunk of data that's gone. And so um, I really felt keenly that pressure um, and worked with lots of other undergraduates who were kind of in the same boat. But for them, they were their idea was they were gonna to go to med school. And if they didn't get a good review from their mentor, or if they had failed a class, that that would keep them from even reaching the first step of that big life goal. Um, so I felt like those students felt like they had a whole lot more pressure on them. I just really wanted to play with plants all day and was excited about getting to do that as a potential career. So um, by getting to watch uh, how these mentors really navigated some interesting waters with, you know, just the different issues that students would have. Um, you know, we had students whose whole families would move with them to college. So they had a lot you know, that they were taking care of on, on top of that and making sure that these students were 
you know, just meeting their own educational goals with, you know, grades in class and then meeting their own research goals um, was pretty intensive. We have a question from the chat. Um, something that I've been grappling with is students not having the quote, privilege to fail, unquote. I've heard that phrase from students. How do we as mentors remove the stigma of failure for students who feel that failure, most often not in the research space, but still in academics, is a privilege? Any thoughts or responses to that? So Sandia, are you talking about um, how some students, like number one, they can't afford to fail because they will lose scholarship money or access to resources at their university if they they don't um, have the honors program or scholarship or there's that but there's also students that i've heard who talk about a cultural burden related mm. to failure that um i had a student in a survey who you know in a space where i'd provided like two lines to write wrote me three paragraphs about how as a first generation a uh, person of color in and female um, identifying going into college, you know, she didn't have the, that was specifically like the, she didn't have the privilege to fail. Um, and so uh, she didn't spend time thinking about what would happen if she did fail because she didn't even want to, you know, allow for something like that in her mind the space for that in her mind. So how do we, is it a matter of, you know, showing them that there are academic support services? Is there, how, what, what is the role of mentors or instructors in those kinds of situations when we are scaffolding opportunities for failure and there are these students who don't believe that they can ever fail? I, um, this is such a good, good question. I'll just start with this is mm -hmm. an excellent question. Um, when I've worked with students who have some of the concerns that you're mentioning, I often found, have found success in mentoring them when we can talk about kind of how they're defining failure. And, and I just wanna say, I think that's a strength of this collection that, that each of these pieces kind of defines, like here's how we're understanding failure and working through it. Because I find that sometimes students have a very actually broad definition of failure, that anything that that suggests they're not going to get that A or, you know, going to get set back or, you know, any anything. And it can even involve social failures for some of them, too, that that they um, well, to borrow the Dweck research that I think, you know, someone already brought up today, it becomes very fixed. Right. We have this this fixed notion of what failure is and that's it. And so. Um, helping them understand and I make a distinction in my um in my chapter between what I call like discipline specific um setbacks that are actually sort of the good kind that that help us and can be generative and then like discipline invalid setbacks which means like no this is something that actually we need to redirect how you're approaching it because because that is the problem I found that if I can help students make that distinction it makes them a little bit more open to um I think risk taking is maybe like one one more generative way to think about like privilege open to taking risks that they know are like sanctioned risks, if that makes sense right like no this is a risk that is that is worthwhile doing because this is how we do it right this is how how academics do it because that's what they're aiming for, right, is this sort of um, like credential or sort of belonging in a community of success that they might be defining by way of grades, and they're conflating that with, with academic life. Um, and so helping them understand that these are, and, and I think this happens in the one-on-one, -on -one, right? So this is where we go back to like, how are we building relationships with our students? And I am a, an enormous proponent of small class sizes, right? These, you know, these, these, and these spaces, like, um, you know, what you were able to create, Lisa, with your program, where, like, students can talk through and, and get through these things, but I find that if I can speak with a student one-on-one -on -one and look them in the eye and say, the thing that you are doing is, is worth it, like, this risk is not something that, that you, that is connoted with failure in this type of work. This is something that's worth pursuing, 
And if you, if it ends up at a dead end, we will, like, I will be here for us to reroute that and, and, you know, helping students understand that, um, we're we're here for like practical solutions as much as we are for the conceptual stuff, right? So I was speaking with a student the other day where where this was a, kind of a concern for him because he's getting close to the end of working on a project. There's one primary text he's looking at that he's like, I just I just don't know how to do this one. This doesn't seem to fit, but it's too late for me to read another book. And how am I going to fit it? You know, I need a third thing. And just able to kind of say, hey, like you you can cut out this book like that's actually a completely acceptable practical solution to your issue right now your paper is already strong with these other texts you know he was seeing something as a failure that actually had a very quick practical solution because he was hung up on like you know but we put all my eggs in this basket you know this is i need these credits for graduation you know and i was like and the other solution is you already kind of told me why this book doesn't fit which means you already have something to say about this book that actually is interesting to your paper right this is like i there's another way to solve this kind of practical issue which is a conceptual answer and until i think we really you know i think it's that i think it's when we work with students and when we are are validating them so instead of saying your values are not important right like that's not okay right but to say let's think of a way where what I'm asking you to do or what this, you know, what what sort of good could come of this is actually compatible with your values of like success and achievement. You're sort of rerouting the ways that that they can think about the possibilities, right? If we, you know, and, and maybe we could say the possibility, right? Itself is a privilege. Like you, you know, you're here, you're here at university, use this space, right? To, to explore what's possible for you. I also just want to point out that like just remembering that it is a privilege to fail is is really important for us because we're already most of us faculty administrators are already in a position where if things go wrong it's it's okay right like for example if we're tenured we can have a couple failed experiments or a, a couple grant rejections and nothing happens but for a undergrad who hasn't made it yet they're not in grad school it's extremely competitive to get into a PhD program these days I mean um yeah sometimes it's not okay to fail and I think we have to remember that and and like be be at peace with that with our students right so that they don't feel like we're we're in this privileged position we don't understand where they're coming from so I want to point that out I don't know if there's anything we can do to mentor them I, I think all of these uh, points so far have been great but just knowing that and acknowledging that I think is really important too so thank you Sandhya for bringing that up yeah I guess the only other thing I just wanted to add on the tail end is um sometimes failure points us in a much better direction. Um, I sort of think um, I was never a pre-med, but there's always that moment at the end of organic chemistry in year two, where um, a lot of students are not gonna fulfill what had been a childhood dream to become a doctor, because it turns out this is not their discipline, this is not their subject, and it turns out maybe it's not even work that they enjoy very much. And for some of those students, this is this is an expensive proposition, right? That that could add another semester or a year to college, right? Now that you might have to regroup and do something else. But ultimately, it's 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 for the better. It's for the better in the end. But it's just about recognizing that this is a relatively short term practice. If if doing an undergraduate research experience teaches you that you don't want to be a scholar in the discipline, think about how much time, money, energy, blood, sweat, and tears, you've saved your future self. And that might just be a reframing. And um, I get it though, but right, if like the, the tuition bill is coming, that's not much of a, of a, but it's important to try to take a bigger picture than to say, well, rather than do a major and pursue a dream that doesn't seem possible, why don't you use this insight to switch gears? Well, it is uh, 3.01, so I want to thank everyone. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you have any further questions, by all means, you can email us directly at cur at cur.org, and I will reach out to the appropriate authors. But otherwise, uh, you'll be receiving a link to the video recording, and I uh, thank all of our chapter contributors today. Your um, knowledge and insight has been valuable for all of us, so thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.